like to welcome you to the uh, CBE and Closing the Employment Gap, some research and strategy. Uh, this is our flipped session presentation, and we look forward to seeing many of you in Minneapolis at the uh, WCET conference shortly. Uh, my name is Paul Bowers. I'm a senior strategic consultant with Pearson, and also joining me at the conference will be Keith Lewandowski, uh, and my colleague is also a senior strategic consultant. Uh, we look forward to seeing you shortly. Uh, so our, our agenda is really pretty simple here. In, in the flip presentation uh, uh, that you're viewing right now, we want to address uh, CBE and employability, kind of setting the stage and taking a look at both the need and the hope for how CBE uh, works with employability. We would like to then summarize some research findings uh, and work that we've been doing, uh, as well as some other work that we've pulled together from uh, from literature and, and uh, work that others have done. Uh, and lastly, in this presentation, we want to present kind of an employability strategy framework for how you might think about addressing employability very specifically with your CBE program. Should note that this framework also works across the institution as well, uh, as well it should, but I think the case with CBE is, is especially uh, uh, critical. At the conference, we then will follow up by taking a few minutes to present a couple of case examples to show exactly how these frameworks uh, have been put into play, but we want to spend most of the time in kind of a discussion exercise and looking at some questions for the session that I'll present uh, at the end that you can think about, and we have a couple of exercises we hope will uh, uh, get the conversation flowing. So let me talk a little bit first about CBE, employability, and the need and the hope. Um, you've probably seen a lot of these data points. Uh, there's a tremendous challenge around employability. A lot of the potential students pursuing education say that 90% say that employability is important. 32% of U.S. employers, however, are having a hard time filling job vacancies, especially for skilled workers. And 95% of top executives identify job skills and, and the gaps in technical and soft skills as uh, a big, big, big deal. 65% uh, of jobs will require post-secondary education. Uh, Two-thirds of wage earners who earn high school diploma only uh, earn less than $25,000 a year, so more jobs are requiring college degrees. Uh, and at the present rate, we're predicting a, a gap of about 5 million unfilled jobs in 2020 uh, at the current rate of production. So there's a need to put more people through the system and to develop the right mix of skills that uh, actually drive employability. 80% uh, of jobs require high levels of customers and personal support skills, English and digital computer skills. One in three um, uh, job postings reference soft skills. And we'll talk quite a bit about that. And 92% uh, of executives identify uh, skills gap uh, as uh, one of the top challenges in employability. Now you add to that uh, the story we all know that rising tuition and climbing debt uh, is, is, is also a big issue. The cost of education goes up and the amount of debt that students are taking on increases at uh, what is a kind of an alarming rate. That means that there's a lot of pressure on students and parents to really realize greater value from that college experience. So here is kind of the, the, the players in the, the ecosystem, ecosystem around employability. Parents want their children to choose the right schools and get the most rewarding. Uh, majors that are going to position them for employment. Uh, students want career guidance and experiential learning and opportunities that connect their degree experience or certificate experience to uh, employment, both at the graduate and undergraduate levels. Uh, universities want to provide rigorous instruction and curricular experience. And startups want to connect students, mentors, professionals, and provide other value-added services. There's a desire to re-engage with education. And employers want talent that's ready to work in a diverse work stream. The key is that this is an ecosystem in which these points aren't as neatly connected as we might like them to be. And it's unclear who's responsible for addressing employability. That's partly where CBE has tried to come in. Uh, so institutions are often pushing students onto the job market and kind of hoping for the best. Employers are becoming frustrated with the talent pipeline and trying to pull talent often by collaborating with alternative providers outside of traditional education space. And of course, there are social networks and other third-party providers out there that are trying to connect students directly to employers and mentors and recruiters while being a vessel 
for delivering their own professional development services. So we're seeing a lot of activity in this area, but again, it's very separate, balkanized, often in silos. So CBE represents a new hope. Um, CBE programs seek greater alignment between that experience and education and demonstrable skills important for the workplace. The focus is often on working adults through more flexible self-paced delivery and acknowledgement of prior learning. So it's about degree attainment and getting people into the workplace uh, more quickly and providing a, a more direct pathway. Um, because CBE requires a significant redesign of current curriculum and a greater emphasis emphasis on different kinds of assessments, there's an opportunity to better align that curriculum to workplace skills. That can of worms has been opened up and there's an opportunity to invite employers and uh, data from employment into uh, reconsidering how that, how that works and how that's connected. CBE tends to focus on learners that are outside of the educational space, learners who are currently seeking jobs or seeking advancement in jobs. And that suggests new opportunities for provider and employer partnerships. College for America is a good example of this. CBE is also assessment driven, uh, emphasizing these demonstrable skills and competence and hence should have more appeal to employers. The key here is that none of these characteristics or qualities of CBE are necessarily more connected to the employability or employer without a clear strategy and planning on the part of those putting together the CBE programs. It's possible, and we see a lot of CBE programs that sometimes fail to, to conceive about this, this connection between employers and education clearly. And uh, it's possible to repeat the limitation of sort of the current models. So here's a, a look at some of the research that we've done and research that others have done and some things we've found. Now this is not necessarily comprehensive on looking at all of the kinds of possible things that we could look at, but I think there are some important implications for what we're finding to uh, putting together strategy for CBE programs. Uh, we've engaged uh, in uh, work with a particular law school in the, in the Mid-Atlantic uh, that involved uh, talking to a number of employers, uh, managing partner, judges, federal prosecutors, uh, in order to gain some insight into how law schools can enhance employability. This also tracks a pretty good wealth of literature around studies uh, in this similar area. Um, and here are some of the key things that we've uh, identified. New associates are evaluated immediately, so they need to be put into a position to produce and hit the ground running. Uh, they're being asked to be productive right away, uh, at least in, in ways that are appropriate for first-year graduates. There's a need to simulate the legal environment as closely as possible in law school to encourage risk-taking and induce failure. Uh, the third year of law school is cited as a period where a lot of emphasis should be placed on this practical instruction, but also a wide array of soft and metacognitive skills, uh, things like uh, stick to uh, taking responsibility for the quality of your work, uh, being inquisitive and curious, uh, kind of pushing that, that these sort of in, intangible qualities that are important uh, to success in the, in the legal profession, uh, as well as communication, both verbal and written and interpersonal, uh, were called out as being important. And practical experience combined with these skills, they, that's what differentiates high academic performers uh, and also helps those who may have less stellar grades also uh, be uh, very successful in the law field. Uh, not always the most successful lawyers, as it turns out, are those who are most successful in law school. Um, there's also a need to learn the business of law and an understanding of how to generate revenue and the, the context in which uh, the legal profession operates and exposure to multiple areas uh, as opposed to just pushing folks down a single uh, pathway, e equipping students to be able to shift pathways or to uh, move in a variety of directions. These were all important themes. Really uh, very interesting out of all of the, the, the work that we did in the, the, the interviews, we, we have kind of a master list of meta and cognitive skills and practical legal experience. Um, you notice that the list on the left side is, is much longer uh, and these were very often the focus of a lot of what uh, our, our, our interviews uh, uh, subjects uh, talked about. Uh, is very, very important. In fact, this is sort of, in many cases, they all said, the, these are sort of the missing ingredients, the piece on the left. This is where law school is not doing well. 
law school does a lot of the things on the right side well, um, could be improved, uh, and there are needs there, but it's the left side that was most critical. We also did a study of graduate learners uh, at the undergraduate level, uh, generally across different uh, majors, and uh, it was a series of 36 interviews, um, and these are folks who had earned degrees um, at, uh, at the baccalaureate level and a few at the graduate level, um, and uh, the age range was from 22 to 55 with a median of 27, um, more men than women, uh, and again, a, a dispersion across different degree types um, at the, uh, actually at the, at the uh, I said undergraduate, but that at the graduate level. Um, and it's a subsection of uh, what's related to employability. Here's, here's some of the things that we found. Most participants were generally satisfied with their experience and many indicated that they would re return to school. So they found their experience v valuable and they cited a wide variety of skills gained, and most of those skills were mostly soft or metacognitive skills. We'll talk about in a minute. Um, they did say that there's room for improvement in enhancing students' employability. Um, a lot of them were returning for an advanced degree for career-focused purposes. Uh, only a few participants viewed career services as strategic and consultative. And faculty were uh, viewed by persistent by participants as allies in the job search process, but they tend to rely more on informal networks rather than a structured system. So what we're hearing and, and, and what's suggested by this is that there needs to be a greater integration of that sort of career pathway with the educational experience and the curriculum. And faculty members uh, who may not always view themselves as being um, important in this role are actually important. And uh, students were looking for more structured integration. Um, and active employer engagement in the academic experience was the other big thing that they, they cited. So the benefits, feelings, and skills gained, uh, again, you can see these sort of uh, metacognitive skills and the feelings and benefits, persistence, determination, more articulate, more satisfied with themselves, more self-aware, self-direction, better able to prepare themselves forward in a, in a, a lifelong career. Uh, and then things like persuasion, public speaking, explaining contact, complex topics simply are very important. Technical skills, also important, but a shorter list. Uh, practical business management skills, financial savvy, research skills. So the baseline things are very important, but you can see that it's uh, these other things that we don't often think about in strict academic terms as being very important. This leads us to some research that's focused, focused specifically on the undergraduate level around something called the Connolly Readiness Index and GRIT. Um, uh, Hart Research Associates shows that uh, hiring managers put great value on soft skill persistent uh, proficiency, but only 38% of those hiring believe the college graduates actually possess those soft skills. So again, the gap seems to be here on the, the soft skill side. Um, uh, Monster did a survey in Washington that entry-level workers are lacking in these critical soft skills, but the soft skills are more critical for attaining a job. LinkedIn is also finding also very similar kinds of findings that uh, managers are finding it difficult to find students with the right mix of soft skills. So students' preparedness is also related to this. Uh, in 2016, the Center for Community College Student Engagement shows that 86% of community college students believe they are prepared to succeed academically, but 68% of those same students had to take at least one developmental education course. And 40% of students who had a, an A in high school were still required to take one developmental course. So even coming into college, there seems to be a big gap between a student's academic ability and their preparedness and readiness. And 76% uh, believe that they were on track to achieve their academic goals, but only 39% of post-secondary students earn a degree or certificate within six years. So again, this gap between attainment and expectation. Less than half of the students said that an advisor helped them to set specific academic goals. Um, so in response to this data uh, that actually has been emerging for a long time, uh, Dr. David Conley 
really developed a readiness tool called the CRI or the Conley Readiness Index. It's based on a decade of research of what it takes to succeed in college. And he identified 42 actionable objectives that were organized into four key areas, cognitive strategies, content skills, learning skills, and techniques and transition knowledge. And it's the context of students' personal goals that frames or should frame these four areas and these 42 actionable objectives. And the idea was to begin to take a look at how well students are meeting these actionable objectives and based on a series of interventions and programs to get students ready, how far do they move down the road? And how does that help us track that? Uh, because very often students' perceptions and self-perceptions aren't necessarily reliable. So in a pilot study at Southern Illinois, and, and these, these results continue to be kind of proven out uh, in lots and lots of work with uh, CRI, um, the tool can be used to improve student outcomes while preparing individuals for success. It finds that 40, 54% of students don't break down complex assignments into smaller components. Uh, half students don't read regularly for understanding. They just read to complete the reading. 55% uh, don't employ proven strategies for writing essays like outlining. A lot of students struggle with self-control, um, such as completing homework before socializing. 94 say they have goals, but they're not diligent in tracking their progress. And most students uh, don't regularly make connections to their field of interest, directly speaking to employability. 60% uh, have not participated in an internship or job search, and most students consistently give their best effort in the classroom. And they also have a tendency to avoid taking the most challenging, or do not give their best effort, and they also tend to avoid taking the most challenging courses. So they're not directing the, you know, directly taking on the challenges. And the idea around CRI is to help surface this um, data on an institutional basis so that you can plan uh, interventions or uh, uh, activities to mitigate them, as well as providing feedback to students to build that self-awareness. And building that self-awareness at the student level is also related to something, a, a similar gauge called GRIT. Uh, which grows out of Conley's and, and is related to Conley's research, and that's growth, resilience, instinct, and tenacity, as well as the robustness of abilities around growth, resilience, instinct, and tenacity. Uh, and that's really what defines grit. And grit can be measured and scored, and students can look at their own grit score and then look at specific strategies on how to improve it. And it's these kinds of strategies that can actually be integrated right into and alongside and part of the regular classwork uh, as you're building the curriculum. Uh, and this is really, really important in, in kind of achieving that integration. And again, in the CBE programs where students don't have the rich outside of the classroom experience and contact necessarily, they're working at their own self pace. This ability to drive self-reflection as well as integration into the curriculum with using tools like CRI and GRIT can be really, really important. Uh, so the efficacy of GRIT is, is also being proven out. This is a, a preliminary result after only one semester at Lone Star State uh, in Texas, but students with higher GRIT scores tend to be taking more student cumulative credits. And when we're talking about a self-paced CBE program in which we're trying to drive students to completion on some reasonable time frame, even if it's uh, self-paced, the ability to attack those challenges, to continue to take um, uh, credits and complete competencies that are going to uh, drive toward reasonable completion is important. And grit seems to be an important and significant factor in doing that. Um, persistence rates among students who uh, have participated in grit and looking at their own grit scores, and as well as courses that integrate uh, grit into the curriculum, uh, also tend to show some higher results. And again, this is only after one semester. Uh, the interesting thing will, is to look at what happens potentially over time. Um, and this involved uh, educators or teachers, instructors, who are infusing grit into the curriculum and infusing it into the curriculum by simply adding some components that drive self-reflection and awareness of grit into already existing assignments. So it doesn't actually create more work. It's just simply servicing these qualities of grit and how certain assignments are designed to build some of these uh, grit qualities. 
One of the other areas we've also taken a look at is employer engagement. So in, in addition to sort of how you build and look at the curriculum, how do you also empl em em engage employers? Um, and kind of the historic way of doing this is that we've got the student, the worker, we've got the provider, the educational institution uh, does something and then passes them off to the employer. Um, what we're seeing now though is that it's more of extended value chain. There may be multiple providers or different stages and there are different support systems. And then there's experiential learning, which is work-based learning. And what this suggests is a much more dynamic and collaborative relationship along this chain. And that requires careful thinking and planning on the part of, of the providers so the, and, and, and preparing students through tools like GRID and CRI to work through this process and then engaging employers as part of that. So again, we're back to that collaborative participation in the ecosystem is really the sort of the, the new thing that uh, is going to be the important imperative. Uh, Peter Stokes who wrote a really excellent book that came out last year on higher education and employability, new models for integrating study and work, looked at this sort of institution employer collaborative uh, that lies across the entire value chain. Uh, so it's marketing, enrollment, program planning. You can look at all of the things across here. These represent all of the points at which you can bring that strategy and how you design what you're doing uh, with your uh, CBE program to promote employability. This model works equally well in the traditional uh, uh, campus and classroom experience, but it's very, very important for CBE. Uh, CBE programs may not necessarily have readily available career services. So how do you build that into your program? And how do you bring alumni back in as mentors uh, or touching students to keep them moving forward in that uh, uh, self-paced uh, CBE uh, uh, kind of environment? Uh, so how you use this framework to build an institutional strategy is important. Uh, we've also developed something called the CBE Playbook that you can uh, download from, from Pearson's uh, website. Um, and as, as part of this, we, we do talk about how you look at the student journey and the development of your curriculum and where you look at um, thinking about employability. Uh, so at the pre-enrollment stage, what programs have demand and how does that demand help you construct um, clear pathways? And that's something that CBE programs are really focused on. But who do we then target and how are they uh, a broad range of folks? Are they in place um, folks who are working? This is a, this is this marketing and recruiting area is a prime place for employer engagement uh, and connection uh, and very powerful. Uh, and, but in developing curriculum and assessments, that's an area, uh, as I've suggested earlier, that we also open up for employer engagement. Professional growth, that's the uh, CRI kind of grit things. And then how you uh, drive placement and, and do the completion. Uh, so this is a, a kind of a simpler framework in thinking through, have we uh, taken a look at our strategy that touches all of these points and not just one of them? We do have some additional resources. Uh, there's an excellent study uh, by the uh, Hanover Group uh, about uh, recruiting and placement strategies. Uh, EAB did an excellent study also as well on Next Generation Career Services, we have the link uh, to that. Uh, so there's lots of strategies that help you put together your approach. How are those going to work across your CBE program? So I'd like to close this last section of the, uh, uh, the flipped classroom uh, presentation with sort of putting some of this together. What does this mean? What are the implications for uh, developing a CBE employability strategy? Uh, first is that you have to really look at this on an institutional or program level basis. And this is the great opportunity for CBE because you already have to look at CBE programs um, more than just the individual courses. And it's more than just what individual faculty are doing. How do you build this into a program? It's not just about job skills. It's about other metacognitive soft skills and knowledge too. Employability is complex. It involves a set of inputs, variables, and participants in the educational process to build that employability ecology. So how do you put that ecology together to work for you in ways that are very efficient and focused and create a model that drives uh, what you want to achieve? Um, employability's efforts are 
often scattered across separate units. So the challenge is in your CBE program is how do you bring that together into uh, something tighter, more focused, more efficient. Um, higher education and economy have always been closely linked, but I think the stakes are higher as more jobs require certificates or degrees. And that's what the data on the, on the right side is, is kind of showing you that the, the value of a, of, a, of a degree in an education at a bachelor's degree, two-year degree, it's still higher than, uh, uh, than just a high school diploma. And the unemployment rate is much lower the more you move through educational attainment. So this is all about how you drive educational attainment, and that's linked to employability. And potential students are demanding more. So that suggests this institutional strategy. Uh, institutions need a more coordinated uh, approach. The opportunities to engage in partnerships are deeper. Uh, there's a greater emphasis on integrating employability within and across the curriculum and experience, student experience. The curriculum and career development are no longer, any longer conceived of as something separate. They are one and the same. And I think that's, that's a challenge uh, sometimes to get faculty to understand these things are very integrated, uh, sometimes not. And it depends on what kind of programs you're dealing with. Uh, and very often CBE programs have have focused on those areas where the faculty get it in the healthcare professions, they certainly understand this. In uh, a lot of the uh, IT and, and ma advanced manufacturing and, and areas like that, but in other areas, uh, maybe less so. Uh, a greater holistic view of student ability is needed that integrates cognitive and metacognitive and does that in the classroom or in the educational experience and not as something that's bolted on outside. And the institutions require a set of strategies. So this, this USEM model is, a, is an, actually an earlier model of employability that takes a look at how you put together skillful practices, subject understanding, metacognition, employability, and personal qualities. And it's really putting this together in a, a model. So these are some, some frameworks that might help you look at that. And these think of these as sort of scorecards. As you develop your approach, where do you want to be and what are your strategies doing? And first is employment engagement strategy. How are we enhancing engagement with key employers? What's the level of employer commitment that's required? Is it low, moderate, high? Uh, and, and the degree of partnership, so to speak, with employers. I think we're finding employers more and more willing to take on higher levels of commitment if it drives a pipeline of qualified students to them. And I think that's the key. And there's also the indirect and direct impact. Is the direct is the impact indirect, like advisory boards. They're great, you wanna do those, but it's not necessarily having it a direct immediate impact. But as we move to co-developed programs or co-op programs or programs with more integrated experiential learning opportunities, there seems to be greater uh, direct impact. So where on this are you involving uh, employers. And with CBE, it's really this co-developed programs and that involvement at developing the curricular and more importantly, developing the kind of authentic assessments that drive your CBE program that are likely to move you to the upper right-hand corner. Um, and we'll talk about some of these, uh, uh, some of these models when we get into uh, the session. I've talked about a, a curriculum and involvement. And in the traditional way, um, engaging employers has been done, but it's often informal. We're kind of asking them and then we go off and do our things. It's, it's very often summative, meaning look at this program uh, and tell us you know, whether it aligns. And it's passive. Uh, we, we might ask the employer some things, but they're not really getting their hands dirty and developing. It's more advisory. There's an emphasis often on networking or connection or coming to campus to speak, job fairs and things like that. And it's often focused on the content. Is this the right content and the right knowledge and skills? The more innovative ones are looking at more formal partnerships in which there's really a clearer collaboration and inviting faculty into the formative stages of curriculum and especially at CBE in the development of those assessments. If we're asking students to demonstrate skills, how are we assessing those skills and how does that align with what they actually will be doing in the workplace? Uh, it's more active. Uh, and collaborative, and there's more of an emphasis on mentoring or experiential opportunities or how you integrate uh, that experience. And it's driven now more by goals and assessment than necessarily content. So that's, that's another way in terms of involving uh, faculty in the curriculum. 
Um, I think it's important to have a, an employability scorecard uh, that looks across these areas, student development, economic impact, and degree attainment. And what are your key goals in each of those areas? And more importantly, what are the key metrics that we're trying to achieve? Now, this is not completely filled out. You, know, you really want to look at what this means for you. You can't move all of the needles or achieve enormous uh, overarching goals. So you need to look at how you focus the goals and what are we trying to achieve uh, regionally and with students and in what particular areas and what are our, um, in, in our metrics. Our metrics for participation, for retention and persistence, for postgraduate success. And then how do we measure those metrics? Uh, and having that sort of employability goals and targets scorecard is really, really important to developing uh, your particular model. We can also take a look at things from a student perspective. Uh, if we look at career preparation, there are probably about nine different milestones that are important to career preparation, moving from the left to the right. And a lot of the things that are being addressed by the Connolly Readiness Index and GRIT, a lot of that have to do with the kinds of things that typically we might find in the first year or early going kind of milestones, and they build out as we transition into uh, employment. So how is the program addressing those? And then in terms of academic, academic preparation and moving through the program academically, um, the curriculum, how are different strategies lined up at different places along the way, and how can you integrate them? So placing students in sort of the appropriate pathways or creating a pathway as early as possible is, is a key to bridging that career preparation and academic uh, preparation. Is this a certificate program uh, that's done in a CBE way that may lead to some sort of uh, option for degree or converting into degree credits or rolling into stackable certificates? And how, how do those certificates take parts of these that build on something that might then get completed or funnel into a, a sort of a swim lane in, in a degree program. And how are these things lined up? It's not just about courses and knowledge anymore. It's about a holistic career development pathway. And to what extent can you get at this from a student perspective? Very often we understand this, but students don't understand this and there's not nearly enough reflection and self-reflection built in. A great hope for CBE because it does focus on that self-reflection because students have to prepare to achieve these competencies. But how is that woven in and how are those conversations with students as they're moving along uh, occurring? And lastly, where do we want to tar target the balance of cognitive, metacognitive, and career and technical skills. Not any one of these things is necessarily more important than others, even though we're seeing lots of gaps in the metacognitive and cognitive skills. But how are these things balanced? And how are these things built into your program? These are all important frameworks to take a look at in building your particular model. So at the conference, we're going to briefly kind of present some example models that illustrate how these things get put together, but then we're going to engage uh, your conversation on how would you craft an employability strategy for your CBE program. Maybe you're already doing this, and what pieces uh, are you focusing on, and is there an opportunity to focus on other pieces? How do you put this all together? It's not easy, it's challenging, but this is an opportunity, we hope, at the conference to share uh, uh, your experiences and uh, some of the things that uh, we've been working on uh, with people that we, uh, we touch. So we look forward to seeing you. Please email us with any questions and we look forward to seeing you in Minneapolis. Thank you.